Chairman. And with that, uh, we're open for nomination. And I'm going to Senator Dawson, Representative Heath, the co chair of the committee. Third second on the motion? I'll second. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay. All right. Um, adoption of rules. Didn't have that in my back of her head. You have a copy in front of you. And uh, move them over. <coughs> uh, we have a quorum today. We can make a majority vote. Well, I don't think we're going to vote today. Uh, Matt Mason's manual is our, our, our Bible. And um, okay. Any other questions on the uh, rules? I move to that rule. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, rules have been adopted. Um, okay. Um, I, I, the charge of this meeting is to gather information uh, on our uh, on the issue of of the use and the um, uh, addiction to uh, opioids and heroin, uh, whatever comes along with that. And uh, our whole purpose here is to gather information. We will not be proposing any bill in this meeting. I think that will come after we've gathered all the, all the information over the next two days. And then I think that both houses will start to work on legislation and, and begin to move it forward. So, that, do you have anything to add to that, Senator? Uh, no. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's start with opening remarks. Senator, do you have anything to say about our work here? Uh, thank you, Representative Keaton. Uh, thank you for the committee members, I will say, and uh, members of the audience who uh, took your time out of your schedules to come here these next few days and help us do the right thing. Uh, you know, like a lot of drugs, uh, opioids have been around for thousands of years, but as mankind has evolved, so is our drug usage. And what used to be growing on a plant in a far off land that was brought over here is now being uh, isolated into a compound and manufactured in, for a variety of forms of uses. Uh, obviously, uh, there is a medical side usage, and then there is a black market usage when we talk about fentanyl. Uh, this committee uh, hopefully will start to provide some solutions to the epidemic that we are facing. And that is that we have persons who are otherwise not susceptible to criminal activity becoming addicted to this highly addictive drug. And this send down to lifestyle which you otherwise would not suspect. This is not just strangers on the street. This is our neighbors, our friends, and our family uh, that are being victimized by this. Uh, hopefully, as I said before, we can find a pathway forward. Um, methamphetamines is still the number one drug in Iowa. It will continue to be. Uh, but this is something that has snuck up on us, and we will provide solutions one way or the other to begin to hopefully uh, stimulate the tide of what is coming our way. Well, I'd like to, uh, first of all, uh, thank the legislators that are here on this uh, interim committee for taking time out uh, from their busy schedules to come here to Des Moines for two days to help us try to seek resolution on what to do with this opioid problem that we have in our state. Um, I recognize that uh, legislation involving opioids has been handled by, uh, by 
public safety and some of those issues have been addressed. We will continue to, to address public safety as we proceed, but I think also we are going to be looking at health, the health aspects of, on, the, on the side of that this year. Um, we do have an epidemic in this state. Last year, there were 200 lives, 200 islands, died either directly of overdose of opioids or related activities to those opioids. 200 people lost their lives. And so I think this committee uh, has two things to work on. First of all, dealing with the addiction itself and trying to prevent that addiction. And at the same time, discussing and addressing the need for treatment to those, issues, those individuals who have become victims of the, the drug itself. Um, I look forward to uh, hearing from our presenters today and tomorrow. They've come from <coughs> across the country and across our state, and uh, we will hear uh, the, this, the issue of, of opioid addiction and across the United States. And I think then for the rest of the meetings, we will hear from our islands to tell us exactly what's going on in our state also and what maybe they feel we should be doing about it. We're here to listen. We're here to evaluate what you have to say. And I hope that when we come back in January, we will have legislation ready to address the problem. Representative Ivanovich, you have been Thank you, Representative Heaton. It's not often in life you get a second chance to make a good first impression. Um, some of you in the room may know that we had a committee similar to this appointed last year to address uh, opioid-related prescription pain medication-related issues. We did not successfully meet um, through the fault of really no one in this room. Um, and that commitment at that time came in the wake of a meeting in uh, July of 2000. 16, where the National Governors Association, meeting in Iowa, uh, hosted by Governor Branstead, passed a compact for the first time in, I believe, two decades, uh, uh, expressing a common uh, commitment to address a problem that is prevailing across the states, in this case, a compact to address the opioid crisis. 47 of the governors signed that compact. Uh, and we've seen a movement in many states, many states that frankly have bigger evidence of this problem than Iowa does, granted. But I think Iowa has fallen behind the curve, and this committee, I think, creates a chance on our part as a legislature to get back ahead of the curve. And as Representative Heaton alluded to, uh, for the benefit of speakers, you know, what, what are my interests? I think Representative Heaton alluded to the fact that many of us feel this is primarily a public health problem, not a law enforcement problem, although it has law enforcement dimensions that we need to continue to address. Uh, and that we need some, uh, really a, co a compact between public health and law enforcement if we're to move forward on this in this state in, uh, uh, in a cohesive way based on common ground and common principles. So I look forward to using these meetings really as a chance to get those various stakeholders together because we're going to need broad-based support for the legislation that we do produce that uh, we'll be working on uh, after the meeting. And also, from my own standpoint, we have many of us here. We did take the opportunity during the past session to sit down informally with various groups, including some in this room, to educate ourselves uh, in preparation for these meetings. Um, and to a certain extent, I think you can assume that we have a basic education on the dimensions of the problems. And from, from my standpoint, what I'd be interested in hearing from various speakers is, uh, what do you think are the action steps that this legislature and this governor need to take uh, and maybe provide a rationale supporting those action steps uh, based on the information that you have for us. Uh, and I think that would help us uh, begin to more quickly identify what we can do uh, because I think we need to be ready to go on day one uh, to get something done and the, at most other days we'll have to do it. So I appreciate the diligence of Representative Heath and Senator Dawson for putting together this two-day meeting in a very ambitious and comprehensive uh, schedule of speakers. Any further comments? All right.
Um, I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, 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 Representative Canon Lund Lund Lundgren is here, uh, and uh, also um, Senator Tom Green is here with us today. Uh, Senator Kinney was not able to attend at least this morning. He might be here later on this afternoon. Has some family issues that he uh, couldn't make it this morning. So um, <coughs> with that, uh, we'll move on and address the first uh, portion of the program today. Uh, would uh, Ms. Carmen Hansen please take the table? Carmen uh, represents the National Conference of State Legislature, and uh, I listened to her at our summit that we had in Boston, and uh, felt that uh, from a national perspective, no one could do it better than Carmen, and so I invited her to come to us today and visit with us on the national perspective of the opioid epidemic. Carmen Hansen. Thank you very much, Representative Heaton and um, members of the committee. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I am Carmen Hansen with the National Conference of State Legislatures. We are headquartered in beautiful Denver, Colorado, and we represent uh, bipartisanly all 7,383 state legislators and over 30,000 staff across the country. We take no position on state legislation or particular issues. However, we do take positions on federal measures on behalf of the states. Uh, as you may have heard and witnessed, overdose deaths involving opioids have quadrupled since 1999. 91 Americans die every day from an opioid overdose, and this affects every population in every corner of the country. Rural, urban, and all populations are suffering with this epidemic. Legislators in every state are working hard to come up with answers to address this epidemic through prevention, intervention, treatment, recovery policies, which you can imagine is no easy task. And it's being done in a cross-sector of ways. It isn't just the health issue. It isn't just the public safety. It's just as the um, legislator mentioned earlier, it's a across-the-board effort. So NCSL uses this multi-programmatic approach to address these state actions. I've been asked to give a brief, brief national overview of the most common policy levers, many of which are best practices available. Slide three shows a quick visual of where we are um, by state according to the most recent data from the CDC. And this is just 2015 data on the map. And you'll see that while um, the darker colors represent the highest rates of drug overdose, you'll see that Iowa is in the lowest category on this map, but you do share borders with higher level states. Also note that the concentrations in the uh, Appalachian region, the upper Midwest, the Northeast, and this demonstrates while every state is addressing the problem in a variety of ways. So again, this problem is staggering. Uh, with an average of those 91 deaths a day, about half of those involve a prescription opioid product. The impact is on human lives. Nearly every person asked can name someone they personally know affected by this epidemic. It's a unique crisis that crosses all boundaries and affects all people. Geography, income, sex, race, all those categories are affected. Human and financial costs to the states, including the cost to Medicaid, emergency room visits, workers' comp, disability, and lost productivity. In turning the tide, legislators are addressing the epidemic at multiple points with policies to prevent misuse and addiction, to intervene, and in many cases, rescue, and, of course, to provide help to those who need it. Governor Bevin from Kentucky uses this funnel analogy at the National Prescription Drug Abuse and Heroin Conference. So if you think of a funnel with the top and people are kind of falling into the funnel of drug abuse, um, they want to close that top of the funnel. You want to, you want to prevent people from um, having a problem with opioids. And then as you work through the funnel, you're going through issues of treatment and recovery. So again, that goal is to narrow the top of the funnel for people falling into opioid abuse. The first prevention I'd like to cover is, uh, is the first pillar I'd like to discuss in this topic. All but one state currently has a nationwide prescription drug monitoring program. And I've heard that Iowa is also interested in this topic of potentially um, improving your own as well. They are believed to be a best practice as far as the potential effectiveness at reducing multiple prescriptions or prevent doctor shopping for additional pills. 
PDMPs are a tool to protect, protect patients and inform prescribers to maintain access to opioids for those who need them. The ways that legislators are using PDMPs to reduce potential for opioid misuse is to require physicians and other prescribers to register to use the sites and to allow for delegates to check and input data for prescribers and requiring prescribers to delegate and check the PDMPs on initial or renewing prescriptions. Uh, requiring real-time data submission or at least faster uploads is a best practice in this area and requiring monitor of data for accuracy is also key. Integrating access with electronic health or medical records is also a growing issue and allowing for interstate data sharing since pills and people aren't necessarily restricted by state lines. The PDMP Center for Excellence at Brandeis University is one of the best sources of information for research and analysis. Slide six shows other prevention efforts and these include prescription limits or guidelines. There are over 24 states that do this. Um, many of them are for first time opioid prescriptions or uh, it may limit for quantities for a day or for a morphine milligram equivalent, that's MNE. Uh, again, these limits are usually a pill count, a length of treatment, or the morphine milligram equivalents. 16 states and Maryland requires a lowest effective dose without a set amount. The CDC came out with voluntary guidelines about a year ago, and many states have looked to those guidelines to help them create policies. Nine states have provisions directing or authorizing other entities like provider boards, the Department of Health, to set limits. It doesn't mean they have to, but they are allowed to. Some states are requiring opioid prescription education and training, which may vary between a short online training course or an in-person continuing medical education class. And I've provided you a copy of NCSL's latest publication on this issue, which came out just last month and it has full additional details on existing state policies. Slide seven shows a brand new uh, quick visual that we just created um, that describes the laws setting limits on certain opioid prescriptions. And note that as soon as you print something, of course, there's always an update within a week. So Wisconsin should also be colored in on this map with a limit. Other state actions, looking at slide eight, in the prevention pillar are aimed at decreasing the amount of pills dispensed or, in other words, being left unattended. These include pain clinic regulations, coverage of alternative therapies for pain management by both public and private payers, and public education campaigns about proper medication use and disposal. Drug take-back programs are also growing in popularity, and non-opioid directives, so to speak, using other products first before prescribing an opioid, and also using pain deterrent formulas which are less likely to be abused. Moving to the second pillar of intervention on slide nine, you will most likely hear about other speakers during your hearings, particularly from law enforcement in this category. Syringe services, are often called needle exchanges or cleaning programs, are one tool. They can be used as a contact point to intervene and get people to treatment. In addition to helping to reduce the spread of other communicable and costly diseases and infections like HIV and hepatitis C, programs are most often run through state and local health departments. All 50 states now have access to naloxone and Narcan. These are the opioid reversal drugs that are not narcotic products and do not typically cause any serious side effects. Laws allow access for emergency responders, layperson, third-party prescriptions and standing orders to public access for these treatments, usually by auto injector or nasal spray. 40 states in DC have good Samaritan laws that provide criminal, civil, or professional immunity to people who call 911 to seek help for a drug overdose. They may not provide immunity for all potential criminal charges, and many provisions also provide immunity for the individual who experienced the overdose. Now onto the third pillar of treatment for slide 10. Only 10% of people needing treatment for substance misuse receive treatment of any type, not to mention the gold standard of medication-assisted treatment used in conjunction with behavioral therapies like talk therapy or other behavior modifications. Currently, only three FDA-approved drugs are out there for medication-assisted treatment, but more are coming online soon. It's proven to reduce illicit use, prescription misuse, and overdose risks and fatalities. 
Behavioral health changes happen in conjunction with counseling, family support, peer, and social supports. Medication-assisted treatment may not be used as much as it could because of the stigma in some circles relating to using a substitute product versus going abstinent, but that may only be temporary. This is a brain disease which may need long-term treatment just like cardiovascular disease or diabetes. It is not necessarily a one-shot or a one-and-done approach because people may relapse. Successful treatment reduces other health care costs, criminal activity, withdrawal symptoms, and cravings. And treatment increases economic, social, and personal productivity and adherence to behavioral therapy and overall presenteeism in life. Slide 11 shows hurdles to treatment. And not all treatments are covered by all payers. Insurance companies may have a what they call a fail first policy to access the longer acting medication treatments, which can vary by company and across states. Medicaid has barriers, most specifically in fee for service programs, which vary widely by state. Residential treatment is optional within Medicaid, and 21 states have no residential treatment. Again, this is an optional coverage. This is where legislators typically ask. But we hear about parity. What is this parity thing all about? The federal mental health parity law from 2008 and the Affordable Care Act both include mental health conditions as covered essential health benefits. But what does that really mean? We know that many legislators hear about this issue from their constituents. Parity means that behavioral health conditions, like mental illness or substance use disorder, is treated the same as any other biologically based condition, like diabetes or heart disease. And those are just examples. Achieving parity is hard to prove or disprove because it's often a self-certification process by the insurance companies. Many states have a way to file an investigation or complaint with the state if they believe their behavioral health issue isn't being covered comparably to other biological conditions. There may be limits on office visits or physical therapy, etc., or co-pays for categories of drugs. These all have to be the same or comparable. Investigations generally find similar limitations in plans, but aren't necessarily violations of parity. Many stakeholders in this issue, um, which can make the issue very hard to navigate, there's the consumers, the treatment providers, insurance providers, and state and federal officials. Slide 12 shows the road to recovery through treatment, and more state actions for treatment and recovery include SBIRT, which is an acronym for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. It is an easy to implement, inexpensive, cost-effective screening done mostly in primary care offices or by other types of therapists. Treatment is a block, uh, bottleneck everywhere in the country. It's that taper in the funnel image that we saw on an earlier slide. Treatment includes initial detox and treatment through the recovery stage. Legislators may use policies to encourage the range of prescribers, which include psychiatrists, primary care doctors, advanced practice nurses, and other prescribers, to prescribe medication-assisted treatments to help people detox and withdrawal. Research shows that substance use disorder is a chronic disease. Again, it is a brain disease. The next big bubble of need may be sober living and long-term recovery resources. And we're just beginning to see that wave swell up as people work through treatment and recovery. Again, states may play an oversight role by ensuring parity of providers. Massachusetts has a state program that does that, and I can provide additional information on that program if you're interested. And all of these policies need input from the various interested <coughs> parties. I'll take a brief minute to uh, introduce some examples of how NCSL is covering this issue from the criminal justice and human services perspective. Please note, I am not the expert on criminal justice or human services specific areas, but my colleagues have provided me with some overview materials and are available for additional information. And in criminal justice, that person is Amber Widgery, and in human services, that person is Megan McCann. And their contact information is on slide 13. Slide 14 shows that the uh, criminal justice system is the largest source of referral to treatment outside of an individual self-referral. And according to the Federal Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, the criminal justice system is that single largest source of referral. Uh, outpacing referrals from drug and alcohol abuse care providers and other health care providers, schools, employers, and other community programs. 
In 2011, there were 1.7 million discharges from substance use treatment programs generally, and of these, 34.4% came through treatment through a referral from the criminal justice system. This is an opportunity for criminal justice, public safety, and health agencies to work together to create policies that work best for your state. Again, there are other policy levers, and NCSL can provide additional information through AMBER. Slide 15 shows the child welfare impact, and this opioid epidemic is systematic, often affecting others around the person with a substance misuse disorder. This includes people and their children. The United States currently has the highest number of children in foster care since 2008, and this is at a cost to state budgets. Children under age one are the highest percentage of any group entering foster care because new parents with substance misuse may actively be using and putting their children at risk because of neglect. For the first time, the adoption and foster care analysis and reporting system has included drug abuse of a parent as a reason for removal. These reasons for removal are not mutually exclusive. This chart shows five of the top 10 reasons for removal that could be co-occurring with parental drug abuse. State strategies to address this include crafting plans of safe care for children of people with substance misuse and creating specialty courts for parents needing treatment. Slide 16 shows some key questions to ask and you could consider some of these kind of those action steps that were mentioned earlier. These are some of the key questions that legislators may use when developing policies, which are often bipartisan efforts across the country. What does the data show in your state? Data is one of the most important tools you can use to target and pinpoint legislation where it may be most beneficial. And this is a really broad issue, so using your state's data can help address it as necessary. Ask your state agencies for data your departments of health, your departments of insurance, your Medicaid directors, they all have information that will be very helpful for you as you, work, as you go forward. National survey data is also available through the CDC, National Institutes of Health, and uh, SAMHSA. Uh, look at what else is going on in the state. Uh, again, look to those agency heads from your Department of Health, your Human Services, and Criminal Justice. And also look into how your state is currently using any of the federal funding opportunities that are out there through the CARA or the CURES programs. Look into um, what some of the other states are doing regarding the handout that I provided. Um, see if Iowa is doing similar things or maybe some of those ideas might be new for you. Think about who needs to be at the table as you go forward in deciding on policy options. Bring those people around the table to discuss what may be best for their agencies and their, and their uh, members. NCSL has facilitated many state discussions and work groups in this area and we're happy to talk about technical assistance options. Slide 17 is just another list of tools and resources from NCSL and uh, again I give you that brand new prescribing policies brief. We have a very extensive injury prevention database that has numerous categories related to prescription drug abuse prevention. You can sort those uh, bills by state, types of policies, and legislative session. The CDC is a wealth of information on this data, and there are other organizations like the National Association of Attorneys General, the National Governors Association, and the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. They all have excellent resources available. Again, this is not something that is just necessarily left to the legislature in any particular state. Again, this demonstrates how this issue is not left for one level of government or agency to solve. It's an all-hands-on-deck effort to reduce opioid misuse across the country, which, with legislators often leading the way. So that covers the issue at the 30,000-foot level, and I'm happy to take any questions you have now or in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have about, we have about 15 minutes here available for questions or comment on what you've heard so far. Uh, you know, when you look at this issue from 30,000 feet, it's hard to feel or sense the pain, the anxiety of the, of the addict out there. I mean, we can, numbers kind of hide the, the, the feeling. The, what's going through these people who are enslaved by these drugs and, and the desperateness that they have on trying to find their fix every day. 
They, they get up in the morning, the first thing they think about is, where can I get my drug today? How can I keep feeling good today? Because once you don't have that drug, you become very ill and, and, and go through a lot, a lot of pain. So, you know, I, 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 I think about, I think about foster care, and I think drug-related uh, foster care. The last thing a child wants in their life is to be removed from their parents. We talk about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. We can go through this, the use of drugs in the home, the behavior in the home, um, uh, sex abuse in the home. We, we can talk about all those big questions that they ask these, ch these children and parents to measure the ACEs that these kids have had. The higher the, the, the ACEs recorded, the less, the more problems this child will have later on for the rest of their life. In fact, if you get up from between four and five ACEs uh, on your scorecard, you'll be living 20 years less than the average individual. And so, what I'm trying to get at is, is that you just don't pull a kid out of a family and say, you'll never see these parents again. No, that's the wrong thing to do. If you're going to pull them, then you make a connection and let and continue that relationship <coughs> somehow, some way, so that the, 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 the child will not feel all of this adverse feelings toward their parents and have an opportunity to return. Or at the same time, treat that foster parent, the foster parent, if they want to go into treatment and try to, re to, to make the home uh, reach a state of permanency. These are questions when we talk about the treatment that we have to consider. Or prisoners who go in as drug users and come out, what kind of support services are we, do we have to offer these people when they all of a sudden are on their own, alone, and previously had a drug addiction? If you can't tell me that there's not a pull to once again consider taking up those drugs again. And there has to be, I feel, we maybe need to address a transition uh, policy toward these people that are coming out of our prison. Those are some of the things I thought about when you went through. And I know that I've been in other, uh, other meetings where we do talk about what it's like to be addicted to opioids. What it's like to be addicted to heroin. The desperation of finding money and funds to pay for these drugs. And how it turns people to other crimes uh, to, to support their drug habit. It's a living hell, and, and people are dying. And so, you know, from 30,000 feet, you have, to re you have to think about what's down there on Main Street and what's really going on in our community. And uh, that's what we're here for. Thanks for your presentation. Anybody have some comments to make? Chuck? Thank you. I forgot to mention my opening comment. I appreciate the co-chair doing a couple things to make this meeting accessible to the public. One, you see there, the live stream on our legislative services website. So if you're if you have groups of folks who could if you're from groups that folks who couldn't make it, you might want to mention that to them. Our website legis.iowa.gov. And we also have on there a public comment button where if you have questions or points to make and you're not on our agenda, you can still do that through our legislative website. Certainly we're not the smartest necessarily people in the world on these issues. So if there are questions out there that need to be asked. I'll certainly consult that. A couple issues, I don't know if you have answers to this today, Carmen, but I'd appreciate any research you can do. One is only 10% of people with um, substance use disorders receive treatment of any type. One of the questions we asked last session of our insurance and other carriers was, what is the availability of and affordability of treatment services in this state? And why are only 17.1% of the people who are actually getting treatment being referred by health care providers? I have a feeling it's because the services don't exist, but it'd be interesting to see 
state by state comparisons on the actual availability and affordability of various kinds of treatment services uh, and where the state fits within that. Um, second issue um, was prescription monitoring programs. Last spring on Iowa Public Radio, the president of the Iowa Medical Society provided a range of reasons why they didn't feel that requiring or mandating physician participation in that was appropriate. One of them, I think, has some legitimacy, and that is, and we're working through this with our own doctors in Dubuque, if you're using the PMP and you go on there, A, what are you looking for? And if you see what's defined as a red flag or a yellow flag, what do you do? Um, so what are, are there any states or boards of medicine that have been helping the provider community put together the protocols on what to do with the information they get from the PMP if they see some issues that need to be addressed. Mr. Chair? Any other comments? Chairman Green? Um, I'm from Southeast Iowa, and uh, we use, as a pharmacist for 43 years, we use the PMP program a great deal. Um, the first recourse we ever had, if there is a problem, was referred back to the prescribing physician. And if the physician was not aware of the potential uh, duplicate use, uh, you know, quite often uh, they thanked us for using that program. And they think they told us to tear up the prescription. I think it's a the PMP is a invaluable tool that the Iowa providers, pharmacists, and physicians uh, can use. And uh, like I said, I, I think it should be a uh, a mandatory step for new patients to that provider and for uh, people who have chronic use. I mean, we can't forget that there's there's a lot of people with chronic pain problems and we the last thing I want to do is to make them feel like they're a criminal uh, we have to be compassionate and understanding of this but the abuse part is a is a real factor uh, so we can't ignore that either so, but so it is a complicated problem um, so I appreciate your information your input and I look forward to reading more about you. what can we do thank you very much thank you mr. chairman well, I understand you're going to be staying with us uh, for a couple of days as we go through this, so you'll be around to uh, answer any questions or perhaps some of the questions that uh, that the representative had uh, and asked, and perhaps you could come uh, with some answers tomorrow and, and, and have an answer to what he had to say. Okay. Thank, right, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chair. You. And I will look into those questions and get you information right away. All right, thank you. Director for the Injury Prevention Research Center at the University of Iowa. And hi, I'm Ann Sewa. I'm the um, Communication Director um, at the University of Iowa Injury Prevention Research Center. 
Okay. So um, we're going to go ahead and move you to uh, slide number two. And what we wanted to do is just give you a brief description of what the Injury Prevention Research Center is. Um, so we are one of 10 um, injury centers in the United States that are funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and we're housed in the College of Public Health at the University of Iowa. We conduct research, um, we train our next generation of injury and violence prevention researchers and practitioners, um, and we also conduct outreach to disseminate research findings and evidence-based programs to populations that are at high risk um, for injury and violence. So slide three um, shows some of the areas of our expertise in injury and violence prevention, um, one of which is <coughs> prescription opioid overdose. All right, so slide four gets us started with, with, with uh, what's happening in our state. Um, so, um, uh, prescription, um, so overdose death rates in Iowa um, have been in increasing over the past 20 years or so, particularly among um, prescription opioid involved overdose deaths, as you can see with the blue line um, on your graph. Between 2002 and 2014, there were about uh, 1,200 prescription opioid overdose deaths in our state. Um, what you can also see on this slide um, is that as in the in more recent years, um, as the prescription opioid overdose rates have been decreasing, heroin overdose death rates have been increasing. And this has been, this suggests that there has been a move from prescription opioids into heroin. And um, as Ms. Hansen had said earlier, um, you know, what our, you know, the trends that you see here in this graph are very similar to the trends that you see nationally. Um, the one difference is that we, uh, that Iowa does have um, lower overdose death rates compared to some states, as Ms. Hansen had said, um, which we think puts Iowa in a really great place to be more proactive. Um, you know, we're not at the level of a West Virginia, you know, for example. So it lets us um, maybe be a little more comprehensive with our approach to the issue. Slide five um, shows, is, is a county level map of prescription opioid overdose death rates in Iowa, where um, the darker orange counties indicate higher rates of prescription opioid deaths and the counties in the lighter orange representing the lower death rates. The, um, the counties that I have circled um, represent the counties in which half of all prescription opioid overdose deaths are occurring in our state. So I'd like to uh, move to uh, slide six. And I'd like to discuss um, a project that we worked on through our injury center, um, which we hope will be uh, helpful for this committee. Um, so we received funding from the, uh, from the CDC um, over a short period of, um, in 2017 of this year. Um, and the goal of this funding was to develop a state-specific stakeholder council to identify policy and program priorities to address prescription opioid concerns to identify next steps in addressing these priorities, and to identify ways to reach policymakers and other stakeholders with the priority recommendations. So slide seven um, shows the topic areas in which um, we wanted our stakeholders to be thinking about. Um, so we wanted um, some, some suggestions around pres uh, prescribing guidelines, um, some suggestions around our prescription drug monitoring program. Um, and I will take a moment, um, because Ms. Hansen did emphasize the prescription drug monitoring program, um, that also in your folders, um, you have this document. So as a side project um, through the Injury Prevention Research Center, um, we did an evaluation of our state's prescription monitoring program and found that prescribing practices did in fact change after implementation of our prescription monitoring program. Um, we used claims data to, uh, to um, look at this evaluation 
um, and not the, the prescription monitoring program data uh, because researchers don't have access to the PMP data in our state like they do in other states. So we were left with um, doing the evaluation um, through claims data. But there is, suggest there is a suggestion, as in other states, that the PMP does change prescribing practices. Um, so going back to slide seven, um, other topic areas um, we wanted um, our stakeholders to think about were um, around pharmacy benefits, engineering strategies, surveillance. Um, and so this is surveillance. We have, in our state, we've got a great death certificate um, system. So we're able to track um, prescription opioid overdose deaths. Um, but what we don't have at the state level are really great mechanisms for tracking the non-fatal. Um, prescription opioid and other opioid involved um, outcomes like abuse or addiction um, or misuse. Um, other strat or other uh, topics that we wanted the stakeholders to think about um, were around overdose prevention and harm reduction, um, like the naloxone distribution programs, for example, um, addiction treatment, and then also community-based prevention strategies. So the idea here is that, um, is that you know, it's not just about the prescription monitoring program, it's not just about the addiction treatment, it's about taking a comprehensive approach to the issue. And in communities and in states that have taken a comprehensive approach, you're seeing reductions in overdose deaths. And I preface that by saying there's not a lot of research out there, but the, a comprehensive approach does seem to make a difference. And, and Ohio is an example of a state that's kind of leading this um, at the moment. And I'm happy to, to provide any literature or summarize literature um, you know, that, that talks about state-level approaches uh, that have been effective. Um, so moving on to uh, slide number eight, um, I want to talk about um, the Iowa stakeholder meeting that we held um, that we received funding for. So this was a meeting that was convened by the Injury Prevention Research Center, and we wanted to accomplish three things. Um, one was to identify what Iowa is doing to address prescription opioid issues, to propose um, new policies and programs, or um, propose any changes to existing policies and programs. And we also wanted to identify policy and program priorities to address prescription opioid concerns. Um, and there were a total of 38 um, stakeholders at this meeting, which was held in April of this year. So moving on to slide nine. Um, the stakeholders, um, the, this slide um, as well as the next one shows the composition of the stakeholders that were at this meeting. Um, we had representatives from the Board of Pharmacy, specifically from our prescription monitoring program. We had representatives from community and harm reduction coalitions, from our governor's office of drug control policy. We had several representatives from healthcare, um, including emergency medicine, nursing, pharmacy, psychiatry, treatment services. We had a couple of people from um, an insurance company who must remain nameless. Um, we had an investigative reporter. Um, the executive director from the Iowa Poison Control Center was there. Um, and then if you move on to slide 10, it continues with, um, we had someone from our National Safety Council, representatives from law enforcement, we had legislators, um, as well as representatives from legislative offices there. Um, and we also had representatives from state and local health departments. So as you can see, we were able to uh, put together a very diverse group of stakeholders. Um, and we found that there's much interest um, in, this, um, in this topic. It was not difficult to convene these 38 stakeholders by any means. Um, so the deliverables that came from this meeting, um, one of which um, is this state level report um, that's also in your folder. Um, the state level report um, outlines in a little more detail what the issues that are happening in our state um, in terms of, of um, deaths, of prescription opioid deaths, um, and also gives you um, some information about um, how much uh, medication or how much uh, of the uh, opioid pain reliefs are being um, distributed or dispensed um, in our state. Um, but then it also provides recommendations um, for how to address these issues that came from our stakeholder meeting. Um, also a deliverable that came from the meeting um, that Anne will talk a, a little bit more about is 
Um, in preparation, we wanted to put together an inventory of the policies and programs that our state had in place that we could identify um, around those eight areas that are on slide seven. So um, we do have an inventory um, of uh, policies and programs um, that, is on our, that is on our Injury Center website, which like I said, Ann will talk about. So moving on to slide 11, um, I just wanted to point out that the priority recommendations for how to address the prescription opioid issues in our state were identified through our stakeholder meeting, um, as well as through an online questionnaire that we had sent to our attendees. Um, we wanted to give everyone a fair opportunity or a, a, an even chance of um, providing recommendations and um, maybe some people in the meeting didn't feel comfortable speaking up. So we wanted, so we did an online survey as well. And so if you move to slide 12, um, this gives you a summary of the recommendations that came from that meeting. Um, so one, the first one is uh, providing training to physicians in pain management and opioid prescribing at the point of medical school. The second is educating practitioners in recognizing patients at high risk for opioid misuse and overdose. Reducing barriers to using Iowa's prescription monitoring program, strengthening surveillance, and ensuring that Medicaid and other health plans adequately cover medication assisted treatment and behavioral therapy. So, this is a summary of what came from our meeting, and Anne is going to go into more detail now about these specific recommendations. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go over the full recommendation and then also give an overview of some policies and programs in Iowa related to each of these areas. So um, from slide 13, you can see the full recommendation for uh, prescriber education. Um, it is to provide evidence-based physician training in pain management and opioid prescribing at the point of medical education. For current licensed professionals, develop a presentation that will provide a historical perspective with up-to-date epidemiological data, focusing on evidence-based <coughs> solutions to alter the course of this epidemic. And the second one, educate physicians, nurses, pharmacists, and other practitioners to ensure a strong knowledge base in recognizing patients at high risk for opioid abuse and addiction. Um, slide two shows some of Iowa's prescribing rules and laws. Um, the Iowa Medical Board has a reasonable and responsible approach to pain management. So physicians following this approach um, to pain management are unlikely to be at risk for disciplinary action from the um, Iowa Board of Medicine. For example, a, routine, a physician routinely assesses patients for pain, utilizes the expertise of other healthcare practitioners, thoroughly documents the assessment and plan of care, conducts ongoing monitoring of patient drug use, minimizes risk through pain management agreements. Um, slide three, uh, sorry, slide 15, the next slide, um, uh, talks about some other prescribing provisions in Iowa, which include um, that the prescriber use of the Iowa PMP is not mandatory. Um, prescribers can issue multiple simultaneous opioid prescriptions to the same patient. And refills of prescription opioids are not allowed. However, a prescriber can issue up to a 90-day supply to a patient. Um, slide four talks about um, pain agreements. Um, in Iowa, pain agreements are encouraged but not required. Um, pain agreements are um, a documentation of understanding between a doctor and a patient. For example, it could be about the treatment plan or expectations of the risk for taking opioids. Um, pain agreements are encouraged if prescribing for more than 90 days um, and if the physician believes the patient um, is at risk for drug abuse. And then if a pain agreement is not used, the physician should document the reason in the patient's medical record. And then in Iowa, physicians must complete two hours of continuing education and chronic pain management every five years. And this applies to those who regularly provide end of life and um, chronic pain care, such as it could be family physicians, internists, um, and it also could include specialists like neurologists, um, pain medicine specialists, and psychiatrists. And the topics for the continuing medical education are meant to meet the needs of the local physician community. 
Um, slide 17 is our recommendation from stakeholders around the Iowa PMP, is to make the Iowa um, Prescription Monitoring Program an accurate and effective tool for all prescribers. Stakeholders need to work together to identify and enact measures that will eliminate current barriers, preventing Iowa's PMP from reaching maximum use and effectiveness. Um, slide 18 um, has a little more information about our PMP, which became fully operational in 2009. Um, data is recorded in our PMP on a weekly basis. In some states, it ranges anywhere from real-time to monthly. 42% um, of prescribers and 83% of pharmacists are registered to the PMP. Um, registering to use or using the PMP is not mandatory. Um, some upgrades to make it more user-friendly or pending. Um, physicians and pharmacists can identify um, uh, delegates um, who can access patient prescription history in the PMP under the direction of a supervising practitioner. Um, and then the supervising practitioner can then use this information to make more informed treatment decisions. There are also authorized requesters of PMP data, um, including um, not just prescribers and pharmacists, but also physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and medical residents. And then there are certain groups who um, are also authorized requesters under certain um, circumstances, including um, law enforcement agencies, uh, licensing boards, um, regular regulatory agencies, and medical examiners. Um, slide 19 shows our recommendation for surveillance, which is to strengthen capacity to conduct opioid overdose surveillance and prescription opioid monitoring among multiple organizations and agencies. Um, slide uh, 20. Um, is talks a little bit about, about Iowa surveillance um, that we are aware of. Um, the Eastern Iowa Hair Initiative out of the Cedar Rapids Police Department collects um, inpatient and outpatient emergency department data um, in Lynn County. Um, the Iowa po Poison Control Center tracks calls to the center, uh, and this could be someone calling for information um, about a certain drug, or it could be on behalf of someone who has been potentially exposed to that drug. The Iowa Consortium for Substance Abuse Research and Evaluation um, has looked at opioid treatment admissions in Iowa with trends from 2010 to 2015. Um, as uh, my colleague mentioned, we have um, death, certific death certificate data to look at opioid overdose deaths in the state. Um, and then our stakeholders reported that there's no real-time data for surveillance in Iowa. And um, uh, they spoke about the need uh, how organizations are working independently in the state, and there was a call um, to integrate so that organizations could share information. Um, slide 21 is for addiction treatment. Our recommendation from Iowa stakeholders is to ensure that Medicaid and other state health programs adequately cover all FDA-approved medication-assisted treatment and evidence-based behavioral interventions, encourage or require commercial health plans to adopt similar policies, Slide 22 um, shows um, a little bit about Iowa's addiction treatment. Um, in Iowa, there's around 50 eligible buprenorphine providers who have a waiver to provide this kind of treatment. Um, there was a new federal law um, in 2016 that increased patient limits from 100 to 275. And our stakeholders reported, um, and not only is it hard to get physicians interested in this kind of work, but also that 275 is a pretty big workload. Um, there are also there are limited inpatient facilities for treating opioid addiction. Um, some of our stakeholders reported up to two month waiting lists. Um, insurers are not required to cover medication assisted treatment. And then Iowa received around five million for opioid addiction treatment through the 21st Century Care Act. And then the last slide um, is just a little bit more about our resources. Um, the report that my colleague showed you um, is available on our website, uh, www.uiiprc.org. Um, we also have this table of inventories of policies and programs um, related to, um, to opioids um, in the state of Iowa. Um, and this is just, uh, so what I gave today was, uh, I highlighted some of them, but there are more. Um, and then you can go to our website for that. And I think that's all we have today.
Thank you for having us. We are happy to address uh, questions. You've covered an awful lot of territory very quickly, and I, I know that perhaps some of our members here have some questions over your recommendation. Maybe a little more detail. Do you have anything? Thank you, Representative Heaton. First of all, just appreciate the College of Public Health's involvement in this. This has not been and shouldn't be a part of an issue, political issue in the state. So having the university and the college involved in helping us really uh, assist us in that regard and hopefully allows us to bring some uh, attention to this statewide. For example, uh, one of the questions I have for you is um, related to lack of real-time data um, and and the PMP and the uptake on that, I presume that's variable, 42% of physicians, probably much lower in some counties, much higher in others. Um, and I met with my county board of health on this issue and made five recommendations to them. And one of them was to simply adopt this issue as a public health priority in the county for purposes of dealing with the data question and being the go-to place to collect the data. Uh, and on the physician side, assisting in doing the education needed maybe through those boards of health to increase the uptake in the local area. Um, and one of the reasons I took that approach is because uh, in talking to the Board of Pharmacy, trying to even get the names of the physicians in my community who are already registered, was told that that's confidential information uh, according to the, to the code. Uh, I disagreed with that interpretation. I think it was meant to apply to the patient specific information in the program, not necessarily the physicians. So just encouraging physicians to, um, and creating some pathways to take up these various um, uh, tools that are available. What do you see the role of the College of Public Health perhaps being in facilitating local stakeholder uh, more um, assertive um, activity in the local area on some of the issues you identified? Or is your work done after you deliver this report? <laughs> so uh, we are researchers. Um, and so, you know, convening the stakeholder group um, was, we felt, a very important piece um, for um, just kind of for convening um, a diverse group to talk about where we should be going in our state. Um, you know, the College of Public Health um, we, we view, and the Injury Prevention Research Center, we view ourselves as a resource, you know, in the state and in our community. Um, and so, you know, we are open um, to participating in moving recommendations forward in any way, um, you know, the committee sees um, fit. Um, you know, I will, um, I will um, just go back to um, one, of your, one of your comments. So about um, the PMP registration, we don't know um, the registration by county. Um, the, the, these latest statistics were, I believe, from 2016, that less than half of our eligible um, physicians um, are registered to use the PMP. Um, you know, we do know that, um, that in states that mandate um, registration, that um, there is success in reducing overdose deaths. Um, although um, you can tell from our recommendations that we didn't want to come in wanting to, that the stake, our stakeholders didn't want to come in mandating this, um, and that you know, there, has, there, there needs to be um, um, a compromise of how to um, encourage registration, how to encourage use of this. Um, one of the things that came from the Stakeholder Council um, is that, um, that um, if, 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 uh, if physicians and pharmacists and nurses are at the point of their education, um, are informed about the PMP and are informed about opioid issues, then you kind of are developing a, a culture around the issue. And so then it becomes, of course, it's natural that you would check the PMP. Um, right now, the PMP seems to be perceived as a very difficult thing to access um, and it to be very time consuming, which is why having these delegates seems to be important. Um, but, um, you know, you know, we have to address the, the current issue, but then also, you know, moving back to think, okay, how do we change the culture um, around um, prescription opioids and prescribing, and how do you just naturally incorporate PMP into normal, you know, routine practice? So, 
You're in the Department of Health, and not, not the Department of Med, not the medical, not 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 the University of Iowa Medical School or Des Moines University. So when I ask this question, but you had people in the room that would that surely this came up for discussion. You talk a lot about opioids and educating. Our, our doctors to be on the use of opioids. Well, what about the use of the alternatives? What about addressing the CDC recommendation that we use all over-the-counter medications first before you might use an opioid? Mm -hmm. You understand where I'm coming from? Right. You know, it, you know that um, that did, I mean the recognition of the CDC guidelines was certainly something that was recognized um, in our stakeholder meeting. Um, but there wasn't anything that um, that came out um, as a priority in terms of the alternative uh, of using alternatives. You know, we we had um, people from healthcare there, but we um, did not have anybody there from the um, Bioelect Medical Board, um, which was unfortunate. Um, um, and it was because of us; um, we just didn't have them there. Um, so, but that was not something that had come up. But I know it's something that is recommended in the CDC guidelines. On the PMP, um, um, when we were having our discussions last year at the legislature, when we were kind of working on a bill over here in the House, you know, we had concerns about the current status of our PMP system and how it really was kind of felt like it was cumbersome, uh, difficult to work with. It was frustrating our positions and maybe. Maybe that's why there are only 42 percent that, that, that are registered to use it. I'm not clear, but I do know that, and we will probably hear about it later on, that there is a new RFP out there for a new PMP system that will be much better, much easier, and provide a whole ton of information. I know in the state of Kentucky, they have a PMP system you hit the button and you have an instant total profile on that patient. Historical profile on every, thing, every opioid prescription that that person has been connected to. But you only get that data if everybody's playing with it, everybody's in it. Mm -hmm. Because this thing of opioid shopping is one of the reasons we're having these problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, our, our, we, it's not that we don't want to have the medications to handle pain, uh, be available for pain management effectively. But we don't want people taking advantage of the situation and being able to get opioids for other reasons besides their pain management. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, uh, you, you, I know if you kind of discussed it, we decided that maybe we better leave it up to other people to say exactly how we will address the PMP? Is that kind of what came out of what you were working with? Right. I mean, we. I mean, our goal was to um, was, was to um, try to identify priorities for how to address the opioid issues in our state. Um, you know, moving on to next steps for how to do that um, was not something that we had um, covered in our stakeholder meeting. I know every patient is different, and I know, you know, drugs affect people differently. But I can tell you this from a personal experience. My wife, three weeks ago, had her shoulder totally replaced. Um, her surgeon, uh, when we were in the room ready to leave, gave me a handwritten prescription and sent me to the pharmacy to pick up her opioids to help her with her pain when she got them. And um, we'll go in and decide the number of pills that were prescribed, that's okay. Well, I can tell you this, that she took three of those opioid pills over a period of 24 hours. She didn't feel very well. She didn't like the feeling that the opioids were doing. And so she went on Tylenol and the lead no more opioids and no more pain. So I know that every individual isn't like that, but I know there are a lot of them out there that are. I know that opioids are convenient. It's kind of a recent invention as far as the pain is concerned. We've had naproxen and we've had uh, uh, 
uh, IV probing around for a long time. But, uh, you know, the, I, if there's just a tendency of addiction here, and that's what we'll have. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, what our, what our other research has shown when we did the evaluation of our PMP is that prescribing practices for opioid pain relievers have changed, but we don't know, we don't know what is happening instead. Um, it wasn't something that, you know, we had access to. So, I mean, because we know that the opioid pain relievers were being prescribed less, but we don't know if they were do if there was an alternative, if they were moving toward you know over the counter, if they were moving toward you know other types of therapies, um, and and I, I don't know of a literature base that indicates um, what the shift, if any, has been. So when we were at the the conference that we had at Iowa City a couple weeks ago, we broke up and we went into a, a legislative section, and so we sat there and listen to what people had to say and ask what they thought was important. That was the big issue that came out of that room. How, and I, I think you being at the, at, at the at health at the university, you understand, and I think what we need to hear uh, as we move forward on looking maybe at some legislation is a model on how to collect all this data so that we can keep track of our progress and success, so that we can keep track of, 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 of uh, you know, of, 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 of the effectiveness of, uh, uh, that uh, we will have if we pass, move forward with legislation, because I don't think we really have a lot in place right now that is totally coordinated and integrated so that we yeah. really understand the results of what we're trying to do. You know, I appreciate that comment, and it's something that came out from our stakeholders as well, is that, you know, we have law enforcement folks saying, you know, I wish I had access to our PMP. I wish I could just access it without having to do it by subpoena or, you know, whatever the rules are. You know, or I, you know, or we had physicians saying, you know, I wish that, you know, the PMP data were integrated into our electronic medical records. You know, there was definitely a sense of that coordination across agencies that are addressing it and having access to each other's data in a more coordinated way. Now, how that happens, um, you know, it's a, <laughs> it's a different story, but I mean, I think people are, it's getting to where people are demanding it. I mean, they really want that coordinated approach. I think it only works if everybody plays. Sure. And that includes not only the providers, the prescribers, it also includes the people who are providing treatment so that we know the success and progress of their of their patients. I mean, there has to be, all this information needs to be put into a place where we actually know everything there is to know about this and still maintain the confidentiality. I understand. Sure. But, but there's a way to get that done. And I hope that your uh, people over at Iowa City uh, can can get us some type of model, uh, devise some type of model that we sure. can work from. I'm happy to look into that. Yeah, thank, thank you for the charge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, going back a few pages on your slide regarding deaths, are you able to mine down between heroin deaths, fentanyl deaths, and prescription opioid deaths? So um, in the one slide, we, um, we gave you a prescription opioid. Um, and then the uh, the orange line the orange line on slide four is heroin, um, and we could potentially mine down to like fentanyl um, and the others. Um, it might be just be captured in that other um, at the moment, okay. um, but I can certainly look into that if you're interested in numbers. Yeah, and subsequently, I mean, anecdotally, what I'm told out there uh, is that a lot of our prescription opioid deaths are not solely the prescription opioid, but it's polydrug deaths, where you're going to have a muscle relaxer, or something like that, also found in the system. Do you have that data as well to show? I mean, if we're going to be educating our pharmacists out there, it probably would make sense to have them know that a lot of these deaths aren't just an opioid pill, but they're in combination with other uh, things. Do you have access to that data? Um, you know, um, we have access to it in as much as it's recorded in the death certificates. Um, and so we can certainly look into that because we know that, I mean, we're able to track things like, um, you know, drugs and alcohol, you know, and the combination and the risk of death. 
Um, so I can see how much is recorded in our death certificates in terms of like the co, uh, the, co the poly pharmacy, I guess. And that'd be helpful only for a lot of people who are overdosing aren't intending on overdosing but they have different medications in sure. their system. And so we probably need to expand out there. Uh, do you have access to PMP yourself? No. Okay. And if that, that <laughs> you know, uh, so I um, I came from a state. I, I'm I'm I lived in North Carolina for about ten years, and I worked at UNC Chapel Hill, and we had access to our state's PMP data there, um, and we're able to do some great research, you know, um, about looking at trends and prescribing practices, and um, we were working with our local law enforcement um, because they wanted to identify you know kind of the high prescribers. Um, but here in Iowa, researchers do not have access to the PMP, um, which um, we feel is un is unfortunate. But we also know that you know there's a cost you know associated with the third party to give you de-identified data. Um, but that is certainly um, something that um, you know if if researchers had access to it, we'd be able to do things like evaluate the PMP, the effectiveness of the PMP using those data versus having to go to claims data um, from a health insurer. You kind of answered my question there, I guess. So it is a device that you can not only mine for individuals, but for statistical purposes. It's had enough data and it's able to access there where you can use it for that. Um, we never used a PMP at all before. I'm just curious if that's something that yeah. uh, and I know you're going to have PMP representatives here, um, but I can tell you that you know that that the PMP is um, it's uh, the, the data are given by uh, the by uh, the, the, the um, prescriptions that are dispensed, and so you have millions of records. And the PMP covers control here. Um, I think it's a uh, schedule two through four controlled substances, so it includes more than just prescription opioids. Um, but there are millions, millions of records um, in the in the PMP. Um, you know that you can access by name, but you can if, if you did if you but you could also ask, access it. You know, using you don't have to access. You can access it by uh, uh, you can get data that are de-identified. So I don't need to know the names of the people or the addresses of where they live or who their prescribers are. Um, but I can access things like um, you know how much drugs they're taking. You know what the magnitude of the dispensing is. Um, so I could do things more at an aggregate level um, yep. if I were a researcher with access. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any information on the desk would be helpful too. I mean, obviously we all know that fentanyl is uh, highly lethal, but uh, you know that I'm trying to separate that out from the prescription side that we're dealing with here at this moment. Uh, there's maybe ways to better combat that. So, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you, Representative Pete. I'd like to follow up on a comment that you made that I think was right on. That is, information is power. Sometimes without information, even legislators can feel powerless. Um, you talked about access to care, how it's, did you say, two months, 200 days? Yes, two months. Two month waiting list. We're not going to hear much during these sessions, I understand, from people that are directly impacted by this problem. but. The report I hear from folks who are suffering from addiction and their family members is that the windows of opportunity where they feel like they're willing to take advantage of health care um, treatment available to them, those windows of opportunity are rare and fleeting. Uh, and if we're making people wait two months, 200 days, whatever it is, chances are very high that they're not going to wait to want to take advantage of that opportunity when the window reopens. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to information, i really like to see a lot better information and keep track of how well we're doing in expanding that availability of treatment, uh, getting people into it quicker, and obviously what the success rates are. Mm -hmm. If that's something you can put on your list, I'd appreciate mm -hmm. it. I think what the representative is talking about, uh, uh, the waiting list for inpatient treatment, uh, but there is also outpatient treatment available also. Uh, methadone, uh, Vivitrol, there are other drugs that can, that can act as an anti-agonist and they will be able to work. They still might have Still might be taking a drug that also is habit forming, but it does allow them to function 
normally rather than experiencing the high of, of the opioid. So whether the waiting list, we're going to have those, some of those people visit with us over the next couple days, so we'll get an idea of what the treatment side of all of this is and we'll hear from them. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you from a, from a research perspective that the literature does show that, um, that there are, uh, there's a stigma um, still associated with um, receiving treatment. Um, and so that's why I think I think Ms. Hansen had talked about like public campaigns and doing you know community campaigns. Um, there is also the literature also suggests that um, that uh, medication assisted treatment is still a relatively is still a relative unknown. Um, that a lot of uh, physicians, patients, caregivers um, don't know that it even exists or what the benefits of it are. Um, so I can just tell you from a like I said from a from a research perspective of what we've seen in the literature. Well, when we were working on our legislation last year, we discovered that there were seven licensed treatment facilities who could deal with opioids, licensed to deal with opioids, across the state and none were south of Interstate 80. Yeah. So one of the big issues that we have as we look at treatment in our state and decide how, what to do is how do we address our rural areas and have treatment available there. Yep. I'm sitting at my desk one morning uh, last year on a Friday, and a lady was tra walking through the chamber, and I asked her if I could help her, and she told me she worked in an emergency unit in Fort Madison. She was a nurse practitioner. And I said, uh, I asked her about opioids, and she said, funny you ask, she said, it's the most helpless feeling when you get an overdose of a person who comes in with an opioid problem into the emergency room. There's nowhere to send them. Mm -hmm. There's really nowhere to go. Right. I have no tools. I have right. nothing to work with. <clears throat> and that's kind of the frustration I think that we're dealing with in this state right now as we try to deal with this. And our, I think one of the things that we have to look at is how do we go from the urban areas and, and, and get out into our rural areas with access to treatment. Yeah. Well, and you can tell from like the county level of map that we provided you. I mean, it's, this is not just an urban thing. You know, it is affecting our, our rural counties as well, and that's very similar to what other states are seeing. It's a both it's a, an urban and a rural issue, but it's harder for the rural folks to get access to to care. Are there any further questions of the ladies here? Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for having us. Appreciate it very much. And keep us uh, uh, keep us uh, keep us abreast on what you're doing as far as creating this model of data collection. We're very serious. You know what? Think yeah. I, I have it on my list, and I will. I'm taking it very seriously. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Well, we've eaten into our break a little bit, but uh, that's fine. Uh, let's take ten minutes, take a break. Relax a little bit and we'll move on here for a second.
everybody got relaxed, did a little screen cleaning, and everything, and we're back. Um, this next uh, the next presentation is coming from the Board of Medicine, the Board of Nursing, and the Dental Board. Uh, I'd like to have uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Mark Bowden come to the table, Kathy Weinberg with the Department of Nursing, and uh, Dr. Phil McCall of the Dental Board. Now, I'd like to say something about all this. Um, last year, when we were working on some potential legislation, these three individuals and their associations were very helpful in helping us uh, put together our proposal. And I'm really happy that they're coming forward to us this year and give us a catch-up on where they are and, 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 and the steps that have been taken individually by the board of Texas. So with that, uh, I, I, I don't know which one wants to start. Thank you. How about ladies first? Oh, well, thank you. And uh, so, Kathy, you want to let us know what's happening? Okay? Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for having um, representatives from the, the boards. So really, um, just to give a, and it's a very brief overview, and I've given you a um, memo. I did not uh, submit anything prior to the meeting, and I apologize for that. Time just got away. Um, as you, so the Board of Nursing is obviously the regulatory agency for um, nurses in the state of Iowa, which includes, includes licensed practical nurses, registered nurses, and then advanced registered nurse practitioners. And if a advanced registered nurse practitioner is licensed, they do have prescriptive authority. So they are able to prescribe controlled substances. So really, um, I just wrote in the memo some of the things that the Board um, of Nursing has been working on or trying to get the opioid crisis um, out there to our practitioners. We did work with um, the Iowa Department of Public Health to disseminate the safe prescribing of opioids for pain and reduction of opioid misuse, and those are, that's the eBLAST series. Um, so we have um, disseminated that. Then also, the Board of Nursing will be launching a new website November 1st of 2017, which we plan to have a um, link, a page that is specific to opioid prescribing and resources available. And within that, we will have the IPH um, eBLAS. We will also have um, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing Opioid Toolkit. And I did give you a, um, a handout of what that um, opioid toolkit looks like from the National Council. So there will be a link that people can go directly to that site. And then there will be all kinds of resources there. Um, then any updates on Iowa initiatives related to the opioid crisis and then any information um, concerning the prescription monitoring program. So those will be on our website, on that page. And then the board and staff are currently updating Chapter 7, which is the chapter that deals with the advanced registered nurse practitioners. Um, these rules have not gone before the Board of Nursing yet. We plan to um, have those go before the board in January. And um, these proposed rules are concerning the standards of practice for controlled substances, including the prescribing and administration of controlled substances by um, advanced registered nurse practitioners. And so really what we've included in those rules is some standards that if a nurse is, to, is prescribing to a client, that they make sure they have a um, nurse-patient relationship, that they are monitoring the prescriptions, that the treatment plan, um, kind of just goes through what what those requirements are. It does say um, we were not able to mandate the use of the PMP at this time, but it says that they should use the PMP. So until we are able to um, mandate that, that's not mandated. Um, and then also, the last thing is the Iowa Board of Nursing does have a nurse um, a program that is to assist nurses with impairments. And I gave you a handout on that also. It's called the Iowa Nurse Assistance Program, which we refer to as INAP. So this is for actually nurses um, that do have 
um, substance abuse problems, mental illness, or physical disabilities that might um, uh, impede their practice. So that really is, at this point in time, um, what the Board of Nursing is um, looking at, and then providing any assistance to legislators where we can. Um, as um, Representative Keaton said, we, we all had several conversations last year and hope to keep those conversations going. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Mark Godden from the Board of Medicine. The, uh, so you have a handout or uh, uh, a series of papers that were distributed in your materials, and, and if we can talk a little bit about that. The Board of Medicine really has, has been involved in a three-pronged initiative dating back to 1997, addressing what it, cons what it considered to be uh, appropriate guidance to uh, physicians who prescribe controlled substances. So the, the regulatory aspect of it, certainly compliance, you have a lot of information in that packet regarding the compliance activities of the board involving physicians, and physician education and outreach. It's interesting that it was in 90, 1997 that the board, and a lot of things were happening in pain, in pain management in the physician's practice at that time, and uh, the board uh, ad adopted administrative rules that started to prescribe what it felt were the appropriate standards for pain for uh, treatment of pain. And uh, there's a lot of pieces in those rules, and they're in our chap 653 chapter 13. A lot of pieces in the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, pain management rule. By uh, 2008, I mean, uh, by, two by 2008, uh, the board had, uh, it, was, it was interesting when you look at the, the trajectory in the 1997 era, there was certainly a, an effort to try to uh, provide for encourage physicians to treat pain. By then, the uh, national associations had identified pain as the fifth vital sign and so forth. A lot of emphasis on making sure that patients were appropriately treated. And 10 years later, uh, as uh, more emphasis was placed on appropriate prescribing of controlled substances and so forth, suddenly there was uh, concern about whether or not uh, uh, patients were being treated appropriately, uh, perhaps even under treatment of pain. These uh, four, three, three of the boards, uh, pharmacy, nursing, medicine, and the Board of Physician Assistants issued a statement in 2008 uh, encouraging prescribers to, uh, to treat pain appropriately and not to fear board intervention in their practice. I mean, that's always something that's hanging over a prescriber's uh, practice is, uh, are they doing it appropriately and will it draw attention to their practice and so forth. Um, when the uh, PMP uh, was, was launched in 2009, our board uh, at that time and has since that time uh, promoted the uh, prescription monitoring program. It's, its materials are given to anyone that gets a license in Iowa, and all of its prescribers receive this information during their licensure renewal. In 2010, uh, there was a lot of discussion about interventional chronic pain management, and this was more along the lines of invasive procedures, not prescriptions, but the idea that one of the modalities for pain treatment were, were things such as injections or surgeries and so forth. And the board uh, spent two years working on rules and a and so, so by 2010, we had rules in place on appropriate prescribing, and then we suddenly had rules related to interventional procedures for chronic pain management. From 2011 to, to the present, we have distributed more than 6,000 copies of a national resource to Iowa uh, physicians and, in many cases, other stakeholders. It's been a significant expense for the board. Those books were anywhere from 10 to to $15 a piece, but we wanted to make sure that all the physicians in Iowa had a, a nationally recognized book that also included some abilities for them to get additional training. We think that's been a real popular tool and we appreciate the uh, Iowa Medical Society and Iowa Osteopathic Association and others promoting the awareness of that. In 2011, the board got involved in requiring training for physicians. The focus has been primarily on on the primary care providers mandating that they, in addition to uh, the, the educational materials that we were distributing, there is a rule 
now that requires that uh, physicians complete appropriate training on re responsible prescribing of chronic pain management as well as end of life care. Uh, ten or six or seven years ago, as we were looking at that rule, we knew that there was a close relationship between treating people with chronic pain and treating people uh, at the end of their life to make sure that the uh, pain was appropriately addressed. That uh, requirement has been uh, on the books now for, uh, for six years. It re there's two hours of uh, training in each of those areas, chronic pain management and end-of-life care, and that's required every five years. The board uh, has been fairly aggressive in making sure that that is occurring, and uh, it uh, has been something that as we look at our rule on that, it targets primarily primary care providers and that would include uh, emergency physicians, family physicians, general practice physician, internists, neurologists, pain medicine, specialists, and psychiatrists. So there's been a lot of uh, emphasis on education leading up to that. Our board sponsored legislation for two sessions in a row, and, and that legislation didn't really get off the launching pad. It was introduced in the, in the Senate both times. It was, it was a pretty simple piece of legislation that would require uh, a, a physician to check the uh, prescription monitoring program if they were going to write a new prescription. And your colleagues weren't receptive to that change uh, 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 for two sessions and back-to-back -back sessions on that felt that uh, it was perhaps uh, too much to expect uh, the physicians at that time. So that's been our interest in terms of mandating that we weren't necessarily mandating it except in those can those, uh, those uh, situations were actually the prescriber suspected drug abuse or diversion. When we uh, wrote rules in 2015 on the practice of telemedicine, which is really kind of a you know, new frontier, we wanted to make sure that those rules gave deference to existing uh, law that dealt with making sure that there was an appropriate relationship between the patient and the prescriber, the, the, this idea that could I just call up on the phone and get a prescription. And so we addressed that by, by defining what we consider to be an appropriate relation. And I think that has been helpful as well. We work very closely with the state, uh, with the Federation of State Medical Boards. This is a, a, opioid prescribing, as you know, is a, is a national discussion and there are national resources that the board frequently uh, refers to. A lot of our uh, uh, administrative rules, in fact, embody parts of those model policies. Some of the uh, board's rules have been adopted as model policies for other states. Are, uh, uh, so we feel like we've been in the game on that. I gave you a summary of the uh, opioid-related cases that we've dealt with from 2011 to present. We've had uh, nearly 200 uh, complaints and professional liability suits that involve what you would consider to be, you know, uh, questions raised about appropriate prescribing or appropriate pain treatment and so forth. And uh, you have a summary of, of how the board has handled those cases. I, I thought it was important to include uh, in this packet of information the, uh, the public disciplinary cases and specifically by name and the circumstances, all of this is public information that has been heretofore distributed to the public, but for you to look at it at your own time, you know, the, the, their physicians and their cases, they may very well be from your community, their, uh, the, and, the, and the conditions that cause them uh, uh, problems that, that uh, and I would say that uh, these certainly represent uh, a good sample, or there's a good sample of the kinds of cases that we find ourselves investigating. We've talked uh, before about, uh, you know, who are these physicians that find themselves uh, over prescribing or prescribing that, you know, do they even have a clue as to the fact that the patient might be uh, abusing or diverting those drugs? I, I would say this isn't scientific, but if we were to generally describe them, many of these physicians are in small or solo practices. Uh, not always, but sometimes they are. I mean, there's an incredibly high profile case in Des Moines and uh, that you're very much aware of, and it's in the handout, which would certainly be uh, you know, a large uh, practice in a, and it was uh, in an urban setting. Sometimes they're rural, sometimes more often rural than urban, but, but uh, I think there's a commonality that there, there's some isolation. Uh, what we have determined is that, uh, in general, that these physicians are not, they're not 
recklessly prescribing or over prescribing if they're doing that that it's not a profit thing it, it, as much as it, it, their, their intention is not profit uh, they know their patients very well in fact they know them too well they they they, they treat them uh, very carefully and, can, and, and it's difficult for them to say no to somebody that uh, might have uh, uh, signs of uh, uh, diversion or, uh, or abuse. The physicians, in fact, are overly trusting other patients, and I think that's something that we have seen. <coughs> we do know that we have strong rules that uh, prescribe the expectations, and uh, the physicians who get into trouble simply aren't following those rules. The, the rules expect that there to be regular evaluations of the efficacy of the medicines being prescribed. The rules expect that the physicians do uh, random screenings to make sure that the, not, not just to see, well, to, to make sure that they're getting the appropriate levels, the therapeutical values. And it, it, it would be interesting if they did a screening and found out that there were no opioids present, yet they continue to prescribe. That would give them a, a sense of that. And most of the physicians are doing that. In addition, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the contracts that we expect uh, physicians to have with their patients, and those contracts are, are pretty, uh, uh, we think that they help them say no, because those contracts set forth terms like make sure that you're using a single pharmacy uh, to, to get these medicines, uh, make sure that, uh, that there's a protocol in place uh, uh, if you uh, needed medicine, you lost your medicine, or something like that. And uh, I think that's been very helpful to Iowa physicians. They have been able to terminate patients who have not followed those contracts. Uh, th that has, uh, has re led, I think, to uh, giving physicians a, a, a better, in a better position to say no to some of these people that they've worked with for so many, so, so many years. I mean, certainly there are red flags out there, but uh, we, uh, uh, we, we see that. So today, uh, the Board of Medicine, uh, probably 16 or 17 percent of the cases that we're investigating involve uh, uh, what you would consider to be uh, prescribing or pain management related cases. And that, uh, if you look at these statistics that I've provided you, it gives you some sense of how we're disposing of those. There's certainly a lot of emphasis placed on uh, reacting as we can. We do find ourselves working in conjunction with state law enforcement agencies and federal agencies and so forth. Many times uh, these uh, physicians and uh, or the community, there's, a, there's, there's, there's investigations in communities and, and many times the, uh, the uh, prescription pills on the street are, uh, there's a trail leading back to somebody that's locally prescribing those and to uh, their credit, uh, they are alerting the, uh, the Board of Medicine about things like this and, and we commence uh, parallel investigations and so forth. Um, uh, I, I gave you a summary on just uh, the opioid prescribing in the U.S. and I, and I, and I think, you know, it's not, it's not like the, the history of world in one page, but I think it's important to understand that uh, the, the, the physicians by and large that were, are practicing in Iowa were uh, the, certainly the, uh, the ones that are, you know, 50 and 60 and older, and, and there's a lot of them out there. I mean, they, they were trained and practiced at a time where there was an emphasis on pain management or, or treating patient pain, that this idea of opioids, uh, I find it fascinating that in 1960, the United Nations stated that opiates are a human rights that are indispensable for the relief of pain and suffering. The international organization encouraging the prescription of opioids, and 50 years later, we're dealing with, with the aftermath of that. So, uh, I think, uh, you, as I say, you have other materials in that packet that, that would, uh, including our rules and our details that are there, and uh, some of the promotions that we put out to that. The Board of Medicine uh, this fall is looking at its legislative agenda for the 2018 session, as well as uh, some of the aftermath of our ongoing review of rules, which we were required to do. We see some belt tightening in our rules. And uh, we're uh, certainly supportive of legislation that, that would, would look at ways to make sure that there's uh, easy access to the prescription monitoring information, uh, even though they can delegate that. I know some states have, 
have gone so far as to move that into electronic health records and so forth. And also uh, uh, the uh, timely reporting of that information. So, have any questions for me this morning? <laughs> All right, we're ready to go. Everybody present and then we'll open it up for questions. Good morning. My name is uh, Phil McCollum. I'm the associate director for the Iowa Dental Board. This is Mr., not Dr. But uh, I'm here filling in for our executive director, Jill Stuker, who was uh, unable to attend this morning. For the Iowa Dental Board, we are looking at data we have available both through licensee surveys as well as reviewing complaint data and by the data provided to us by the Board of Pharmacy through the EMP program. We are currently encouraging all of our licensees to take a survey that's administered by the University of Iowa regarding the PMP, and this information will actually be presented at the board's next upcoming meeting in January of this year. We have also internally reviewed the last three years of both the disciplinary and complaint data concerning uh, opioids and pres prescribing uh, related to those. That information will also go to this upcoming January board meeting. In reviewing the latest numbers that we have received from the PMP, which I believe is dated in 2016, we have determined that out of the 1,600, approximately 1,600 practicing <laughs> dentists throughout the state, 82% of the dentists currently have a CSA, or the ability to prescribe controlled substances. 23% of those dentists have registered with the PMP, and unfortunately only 4% of those have actually used it and submitted a query. Because of this, what we're trying to do in order to better educate our licensees is we have uh, collaborated both with the Iowa Department of Public Health as well as University of Iowa to disseminate some educational materials this fall. This material will include strategies for assessing, assessment and risk, prescribing and misuse prevention practices, patient education, coordination of care, and referral to treatment when, when indicated. The board has also recently created an opioid task force for the purpose of creating guidelines specific to acute pain. There is a lot of information out about chronic pain, and this task force is going to be looking at acute pain as well as drug alternatives uh, for prescribing in those cases. Uh, we've also been in the talks with the University of Iowa College of Dentistry about hosting a one-day symposium on this issue as well as developing some continuing education for licensees in this area. Our board will next, next discuss this at their January meeting of this year. Thank you. Are there any questions for the three individuals? Yeah, Senator? Uh, this is for Kathy first. You said you're making changes to Chapter 7. I know that they're proposed, so they haven't taken effect yet, but can you be more specific as to what you're actually proposing in your Chapter 7 changes? Um, as I said, those are all in draft, and the board has it actually seen the final. So what we're proposing is um, uh, actually just having rules that standards of practice for controlled substances and within these that um, to make sure that anyone that and, and it's um, it's not just opioids it's all controlled substances so that a health history um, has been included, personal and family substance abuse risk assessment. Um, the health record must include documentation of the presence of one or more recognized indications for the use of controlled substances. An ARMP is encouraged to utilize a treatment agreement if continuously prescribing one or more controlled substances. Prior to prescribing a controlled substance, an ARMP should, re should review the patient's information contained in the PMP database. The ARMP shall provide ongoing education throughout the course of treatment that includes but is not limited to risks of using a controlled substances information. Um, an ARMP shall maintain an active DEA registration and CSA registration. An ARMP shall not prescribe a controlled substance to him or herself or a family member. So just really making the um, I guess just rest not restricting, um, just uh, having standards that when a advanced practice nurse prescribes that she or he follows these rules. And I haven't seen your chapter 7. Is that something where you already have the standards, but you're... Or no, you're there is nothing right you now. You have nothing right now. Right, right now okay. we just have it. Those rules are very old. Um, they were written in the 80s. Um, presently there is a... Um, 
paragraph that just basically dis defines what um, prescription authority is, but it does not go into any of this. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and for Mark, I got a question. When you talk about uh, mandating new prescriptions, do you consider all prescriptions a new prescription, or what about renewals? Do you differentiate there uh, for persons who are getting updates and like that? I guess I'm not sure what your terminology is, just so I'm sure I'm tracking what you're saying. Sure. Uh, if you're talking about the legislation that we offered in 2013 and 2015, it was uh, for uh, uh, New and renewals to okay. uh, to look at the uh, to look at the uh, database at that time and just ascertain if there are other additional prescriptions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Heaton. One issue I'd like to uh, take the time now to address personally, and others can weigh in if they think differently. And that is, um, I know. We get pushback sometimes from some folks saying we're trying to unduly limit patient access to pain medications. And I think it's self-evident that there is appropriate use of pain medications for people with chronic pain and in many cases acute pain if administered according to evidence-based protocols. And it's not our intent to deny people that kind of care. Um, on the other hand, I'm an advocate of the slogan, follow the money, and I think any organization, national or international, that advocates for opiates as a human right probably has drug industry money behind it uh, and should be discounted probably for that reason. Um, I hope that someday, someday, the next couple days, they'll be at this table an hour in the future to talk about their role uh, in addressing this issue. My question is, this morning I was coming from Dubuque, listening to the radio, there's a story from Oklahoma about flow therapy as one way to address anxiety, stress, and chronic pain. So we talk about alternatives to pharmacological approaches to managing pain. <coughs> Looking down the road, what role is the Board of Medicine and the other groups taking with College of Medicine at U of I or Des Moines University elsewhere to take a, a very serious and comprehensive look at alternatives to pain medications for treating pain. Uh, and secondarily, um, in, inculcating that into the curricula at the university and continuing education for physicians. Well, let me start by saying the Board of Medicine doesn't prescribe the curriculum for medical schools. And uh, there are two in Iowa, but if you look at the, uh, the composite of our uh, physician uh, workforce in Iowa, a lot of them are from some place other than those two schools. That said, uh, certainly the, uh, the uh, information, our, our uh, chapter 13, uh, uh, thir or 653 chapter 13.2 that deals with treatment of acute and chronic pain, it talks about how physicians are expected to consider other modalities before they get to prescription. And that's, uh, that's always been uh, a place, and I would suspect that that's something that is uh, uh, you know, standard practice. The idea of cutting to the chase and writing the prescription isn't, isn't an expectation. But the information that we have, we certainly, uh, it's, it's very public information on our, on our rules and our disciplinary kinds of issues. And that, if that's something, I, I, I have presented at the university and at Des Moines University on, uh, on our rules and, and so forth. So I, 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 I going to suggest at least anecdotally there's awareness of what the issues are on a very local level. Related to that, we passed legislation making the Loxone more readily available two sessions ago. It came law, I think, in May or June, and just July I had my checkup with my doctor who's a family practice physician. He's also been involved in some of the statewide groups looking at best practices, and I asked him about this issue, and his response was, I'd much rather prescribe Narcan than narcotics to any of my patients. Uh, he says he uses contract with his patients. Uh, this is how you will use the drugs I prescribe, and if you violate our agreement, I'm going to fire you as my patient, basically, because by not being compliant, you're reflecting back on my practice. So it would be interesting to see how we could inculcate alternatives to um, 
pharmacological approaches within those contracts, just as a, as a thought and suggestion. Second related question is, uh, long-term treatment, you've heard us discuss that, it's the lack of availability, accessibility, affordability. What are we doing or what can we do to increase the number of providers capable of providing that treatment in this state if we were to expand access and availability? Are our medical schools producing enough doctors to keep a promise we might make of an expanded treatment? Well, it's interesting. Uh, there's national uh, statistics on physician workforces. And, uh, you know, Iowa falls well below the national average in the number of physicians per 100,000 population. But if you look at the, uh, the uh, most populated 13 counties, we're, we're in the ball game. It's pretty close to what the national average is. So it depends on how you count that or where it is. But statewide, it gets pretty thin. So the, uh, the uh, number of prescribers today in Iowa for controlled substances is a, is a handful of professions physicians, nurse practitioners, chiropractors, dentists, am I missing anyone? I mean, veterinarians for, 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 for animal science. So there's not many, so some of it comes down to the, the authority of who is prescribing within those four, uh, within those four professions. And if I could just say, I think that um, it goes back to being able to utilize all those providers, um, now I don't know, about dentists, you know, in um, treatment centers, but um, so advanced practice nurses to make sure that you, because in the state of Iowa, advanced practice nurses may practice independently. They may prescribe independently as long as they are licensed. So you just need to make sure that wherever it is, whatever facility, treatment center, that an advanced practice nurse is able to practice to their highest level of education, experience, and licensure, so that there are not barriers to them being able to prescribe or to practice. I guess my question is, if we were to establish a new long-term treatment center south of Highway 80, in Mount Pleasant, for example, would they be able to find a doctor or other provider to staff it? That's a million-dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh... You know, if, 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 it's a, if the answer is about more prescribers, but to, you mentioned earlier, there are many, many regulated healthcare professionals in the state that provide pain management other than prescription. Acupuncturists, chiropractors, physical therapists, even cognitive behavioral therapists, psychologists, others, that are, they all have a role in pain management in some way, in their own scope of practice. So um, if you establish a a facility south of Interstate 80 in Mount Pleasant, Iowa. It's not just about a physician workforce, it's about all of those components that you're talk, talking about, the other modalities and so forth. So there's something that needs to be forever uh, uh, evaluated on the physician workforce in this state. Uh, you know, the national statistics say that, uh, that we're well below the national average in retaining physicians who are educated and trained in our state compared to other states. We're a small state, we have two medical schools, and we do not retain that workforce as well as other states with similar resources for whatever reason. And that, that's something that, that the uh, professional association can speak to. But the idea of pain uh, specialists uh, is like many specialists. There's, there's always going to be uh, need for more specialists, whether it's uh, whether it's psychiatry or pain management or, or OB-GYN, you, you name it, it's, it's, it's an issue. I would just say, Representative Peter Evans has thought that we need to look specifically at specialists treating addiction. And are we training enough in our state, people who are willing to stay in our state and help the population that's not getting help now? I think the whole issue of workforce forever in healthcare is, is it is at risk in the state. We, we hand out sometimes the certain occupation scholarships that they serve in a needed area and whatever, but it's beyond the scholarship thing. We have to get our students in our high schools and our community colleges interested in moving into health care. The opportunities are there. 
Um, for instance, when I visited a treatment facility here in Des Moines, a substance abuse treatment facility in Des Moines, um, they, they, they have psychologists that are assigned there. They have therapists that work there. They have a registered pharmacist that, that dispense the, the medication that they come in for their daily dose. I like that, daily dose. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> those people are all there. Now, the person that's running that facility is not an MD, not a doctor. And uh, the, uh, I visited Davenport last week and met the gentleman who runs a treatment facility in Davenport. He has a PhD, but he doesn't have an MD. So it's not necessarily doctors that are the right people. It is administrators who can put the team together and approach the, our, our, our people in medication-assisted treatment as a team. You know, I, I, the methadone clinics that we have out there, some of them, they buy the, the drugs are very cheap, methadone is dirt cheap, costs a quarter. They turn around and charge their patients an arm and a leg for their, for their dose of methadone. And all they do, they have no specialists, they have no uh, therapists, they have nothing. You just get your methadone and go on your way. That's the wrong type of treatment that I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about a facility that can offer a team approach, a, a patient-centered, evidence-based approach on dealing with a person's, uh, a person's addiction. The question for the nurse is, so your rule, rule proposal, is that uh, any different than what there are in rules for doctors who prescribe pain medication? Are you into something new, or is no. there already established protocol in the rules for doctors and pain medication? Right, so we, we looked at medicine's rules and we just kind of condensed. I mean, it's all the same principles, standards, concepts, just probably worded a little differently, but um, pretty much all the same. As I think Mark spoke to contracts, so instead of contracts, we're calling them agreements. Um, I, I think, not word for word, but same same principles, hopefully. I just wanted to make sure. Maybe you were into something new that maybe they weren't. I just wanted to clear that up. And sort of the dentist, you talked about some statistics about the use of PMP and all that. Could you go through those numbers one more time? Yes. This is where you brought in something like 82% and you had a bunch of other things that I missed. It. Yes, we have uh, roughly uh, 1,600 practicing dentists within the state of Iowa. Yeah. Uh, out of those 1,600, 82%, and this is all information that was provided to us by the PMP, and I believe it's dated uh, 2016, so just to make sure that we're a little, a little dated on the information, but 82% of those providers actually have the ability to prescribe, they have a state CSA. 23% of those have actually registered with the PMP. 23%. 23%. And 4% have actually submitted a query or actually used it. So, if we um, address the PMP with uh, um, in, a, in a different manner, perhaps, than we do today, would your uh, association be cooperative in, uh, the, uh, in stepping up uh, uh, more use of the PMP from your profession? Data is always king, as most of us are, are aware, and uh, and that balance with ease of access and how how a practitioner in rural Iowa, as obviously we have a lot of dentists in rural Iowa, there's many counties in Iowa that only have one practitioner, uh, how they can incorporate that into their practice where it's not burdensome, and I hate to use that word, but the truth of the matter is if you're out there in, in rural Iowa and you're, you're your waiting room is full and you're trying to get patients through there, uh, how can you incorporate that in either through electronic medical records or whatever the case may be to make sure that they can either use it or have access to that information and still be able to practice? So I wonder what circumstances would a dentist uh, prescribe the use of opioids? It would actually be very common for extractions. I mean, you'll see a lot of hydrocodone. Uh, I mean, a, a, a Standard prescription would be, you know, 18 or so for an extraction. That could be for a root canal. Uh, fortunately, uh, a lot of the prescribing that is done by dentists 
uh, are more for, more for uh, acute pain. Uh, hopefully they can address the situation before the patient is on it long term. Uh, if that answers your question, but it, it would be somewhat common, yes. Professor Keaton, I think any, um, anyone in this room that has a child that has had their wisdom teeth taken out, when they leave um, the oral surgeon's office, they are given a prescription of uh, opioids, and sometimes 30. Myself included. <laughs> so I recently had one out. Okay, but let's say for the jab, the wisdom tooth fold or something from the scratch. So how many, how many, <coughs> how many days of opioids would you think they prescribe? I would say three to five. It might also depend on uh, when the procedure was done, simply to account in to, for dry sockets, which can happen a couple days out. And if you're having a procedure done, you know, maybe over a weekend uh, or right before a weekend, I think common practice would probably be three to five days. Okay. Kind of, I think that's kind of the same thing. And there are some practitioners who use that treatment modality. They do not even have the ability to prescribe controlled substances, and they believe that 800 milligrams of ibuprofen can't take care of it. You need to come back in and see me, and we need to we need to examine this a little bit further. I think that's what the CDC is trying to get us to. Over the counter first opioid check. See what works. See if it works, and if it does, okay. And if it doesn't, well, then you consider the use of opioids. I just wondered if that would your your profession would be open to considering the CDC suggestion. And and we also regularly receive complaints uh, from patients against dentists saying the dentist performed this procedure on me, and all he would give me is ibuprofen. And I need something more than ibuprofen. Uh, but if, but to, to answer your question, I mean, obviously, we would be receptive to looking at, at anything that's going to help bring about a change. One last question uh, for the medical community. So you list some of these people who have had some problems, had disciplinary action. So if you only have 42% of the doctors signed up for the PMP. How do you how do you run onto these pill mills that maybe some of these doctors are accused of running? How do you catch it? You know the complaints of the board come from multiple sources. They they come from uh, certainly patients. They come from family members who think that uh, somebody is is over prescribed or unprescribed. They come. From, Many times they come from other practitioners who end up, uh, uh, you know, receiving a patient who isn't, who the family is looking for someone to try and figure out if the right thing is going on. As I mentioned earlier, some of the, uh, some of the complaints do come from, to us through law enforcement authorities. We have uh, annual communication with the state's uh, county attorneys, as well as the uh, U.S. attorney offices in the northern and southern districts of Iowa. And encouraging them to communicate with us when they're investigating our licensees. So they generally do, but we, we provide that. So it, it comes from multiple sources. I uh, was just going to give you some information. There was a report out from the uh, Journal of uh, American Medical Association issued a study that was, that was published in September. It was a study of 215,140 individuals, and they looked at the uh, medium observed prescription lengths were, were four days for general surgery procedures, four days for women's health procedures, and six days for mus muscular skeletal procedures. The prescription lengths associated with the lowest requirement for refill were nine days for general surgery, 13 days for women's health, and 15 days for muscular skeletal procedures. Th that, a lot of that would be acute pain, but it would be akin to the, the dentistry procedures where where, where pain is a result of a treatment, not necessarily a chronic uh, e injury or so forth. So naturally, they're looking at the duration of those prescriptions and so forth. And uh, 
what uh, seems to be defining the optimal length of an opioid pain medication prescription for common surgical procedures. A lot of discussion on that. So, uh, and, and one last question on the, on the use of a PMP. You, as a working, as head of the Board of Medicine, how do you feel about the PMP and perhaps requiring practitioners to register and use the PMP? The Board of Medicine has supported registration and use, and I think that the issue is, uh, is you know, we understand the origin of the, uh, of the program and the option that was there from the get-go, but I think today with the electronic uh, abilities and potentially other ways to get them to register, I, I think the board would say that those would go away. I talk to a lot of medical executive committees and hospitals and physician organizations and so forth, and I'm always astounded when I ask for a raise of hands how many docs in the room have not registered, and a lot of them haven't. Some of them don't prescribe, so I understand that, but I would say to them and others, being the layman, that this is a tool that they can use for more information about their patients. And so we would certainly support any, any way that makes it uh, easy to register and easy to access the information. Thank you. Any other questions for the committee? Thank you for coming forward today. Thank you for having us. Thank you for your assistance. Thank you for having us. Executive Director of the Pharmacy Board. Um, we're tasked with the effective legal distribution of prescription drugs. Uh, that's through prescribing, dispensing, wholesaling, manufacturing, and so forth. Uh, also, in, in, in uh, combination of that, we do run the state's PMP program. PMP program has been around since 2009. Uh, some, some of the uh, statistics you heard regarding the percentage of, of uh, practitioners registered has increased slightly, very slightly, to 45.5% year-to-date. Uh, we have, uh, throughout the, the course of this year, taken more proactive steps in education and outreach on the, the PMP program. Uh, right now, our registration process is all handled on paper. Everything we handle, every license, every registration comes into us on a piece of paper, which is then manually entered into a computer program. We are in the process of finally getting into the 21st century and having a database for all of our licensees that would be able to renew licenses online, currently importing our data into that new program. Uh, but in the meanwhile, what we have been doing is each practitioner who does apply for controlled substance registration is matched with the PMP to make the determination whether or not that individual holds a registration. If they do not, then we follow up with an email specifically uh, educating them on what the program is and how to become registered and its usefulness. <clears throat> Other items that we've uh, been working on, uh, the board had back in August sent out a, um, a survey to all of its pharmacists in charge of pharmacies. There's about 900, uh, 925 pharmacies registered or licensed in the state of Iowa and each one of those requires to have a pharmacist in charge. So we sent out 900 inquiries or requests to complete a survey regarding the PMP, sort of their perception and usefulness and so forth. 
really what we ultimately wanted to uh, ascertain from that was uh, the frequency of reporting and whether or not it would be onerous uh, if the board changed its rules to require reporting on a more frequent basis. A couple of the questions I just want to highlight there. Um, so I think last year there was a bill where, where it was uh, potentially introduced to uh, require that reporting to be more timely and right now our reporting is once every seven days. The way that uh, I think we're maybe one of maybe three states that still require or only have a reporting uh, on, a, on a weekly basis. So the idea was to, to, to move that obviously uh, to a more frequent uh, time frame so that the information that providers and pharmacists get is more uh, timely and accurate. So we sent that out to 900, about 925 individuals, 33% spot response rate, and 51% of those said that their PMP reports are automatically submitted on their behalf. So that means at the end of the day, when they submit the report, it's either handled by a third-party processor, the, um, the processing program they utilize, or it's done behind the scenes where there's no interaction at all with the pharmacy staff, which is good because one of the arguments, of course, was how, how onerous is it to submit a report to the PMP? 20% already report on a daily basis out of the, out of the folks that responded. So those 20% that, that, um, that responded, they're already doing that. We see that with a lot of our uh, regional or national chains. They, there may be other states that are more stringent, so they'll just follow suit with all of their stores and submit it on a daily basis. 95% of, of the folks that responded said that increasing their reporting frequency from weekly to daily would not, uh, would not incur any onerous expenses in doing that. So the board has been working through uh, new rules and, and to, to change the reporting frequency from weekly to daily. The rules committee has reviewed that. We will have that in front of our board at its next meeting, which will be reviewed on November 1st. And once, if, if, they, if they are agreeable to that, then the rules will become noticed and, and uh, will proceed down that pathway. The PMP program that we currently operate is, or the software that we utilize, is uh, antiquated. Like I gave a, uh, a, an analogy um, to ODCP that we are operating with an Atari when there's PlayStation 4s available. And this is just, it's, it, it's just where we are. And we're going through the state procurement process. We're getting, we're getting everything in line. It's been published, the RP has been published. And ultimately what we want is a program that's going to provide us with data that we can disseminate, data that is um, affordable. For example, I, I had attempted to, to retrieve data in, in an effort to determine where to place controlled substance take-back receptacles, and the vendor wanted to charge $5,000 for that data. This is data that we're, our pharmacies are submitting uh, to this, to this uh, company, and then they essentially are holding that hostage and saying $5,000 and you can have it. So that's part of our RFP is that information will be, will have the ability to uh, get queries and have instantaneous information as opposed to the routes we currently take. Prior to coming to this meeting, I wanted to get some information regarding the, uh, the number of units dispensed on hydrocodone and oxycodone in a comparison from 2016 and year to date 2017. And I was told it would take three days to get that information, three days, which I, I, it just blows my mind that it, uh, it's that cumbersome for this company to provide us with that type of information. The enrollment process for providers with the new program will be online. The user agents, which are now, each prescriber is able to have up to six. Um, they will also be able to register online. Password resets, which are currently done over the phone, uh, will also be able to be done online. Um, the integration with electronic medical health records uh, will be more streamlined. Right now, we do have that ability. It is available. Uh, anyone who's interested in integrating, whether it be a dentist, a nurse, a, a medical professional, professional, they have the ability to integrate. Uh, there's a price involved with that, 
and uh, a process, and, a, and of course then um, there's a legal process as well on ensuring that that information is held confidentially. So uh, we're, we're able to do it, and right now there's there's a there's a bit of fear that if we were to uh, if we were to integrate with everyone within the state, the current platform uh, with its with its aged programming would not be able to handle all of the requests that we currently or that we would, we would get if integration occurred. So we, we've been attempting to reach out to some of our pharmacies in the state, some of our um, uh, health clinics or, or hospitals in the state to offer an integration pilot that would, uh, that would be funded by the board through its registration fees. We've identified six pharmacies we'd like to test this in. We have a baseline of questions that we'd ask prior to uh, initiating the integration. And, uh, and then we would let that run until we had our new program up and going. And uh, the, again, the board would fund that through its registration fees. But we want to see, you know, what, what is this doing to the utilization rate of the, of the PMP? How many requests is this going to generate if we actually do integrate with everyone within the state? And that comes to another question of, of, of ongoing, who pays for the integration? Some states, it's paid for by the, um, by the folks that, that administer the program. And I've looked at our registration fees and our incomes, and we just don't simply have the money to be able to integrate and pay for that integration with uh, everyone that is that's in the state or that's registered or had a controlled substance registration or a pharmacy license. It's just not doable. We'd have to double our fees for controlled substance registration from, from uh, every two years to annually and then increase the fee by $30. And if that were to take place, then we would uh, be on the right track to be able to fund that integration for anyone who is interested. And again, this is to, to, to extend that to anyone that's interested. Yeah, I think it would be prudent to, to wait until our new our new software is in place. The estimated timeline for the software to be in, in place and functioning is April 2nd, 2018. Our PMP responses are due back November 3rd. We're going to be looking at vendor demonstrations on November 13th. One of the pieces that the, the board's working on this year is very similar to uh, last year's legislative piece that uh, we, we intend to introduce. Again, this will be reviewed by the full board at its next meeting. Um, but it's going to be a mirror image of what we attempted last year. And that was uh, requiring prescribers to um, report dispensings to the PMP uh, and just to be clear this is dispensings not prescribing so if they were if they were handing out any controlled substances to patients for the patients to take home for self-administration we would request those to be uh, reported to the PMP we'd also like to add the provision to permit the the PMP to disseminate pro uh, active reports or proactive notifications. And what that looks like is um, if a patient meets a certain criteria, uh, whether it be milligram morphine equivalents per day, number of providers, number of pharmacies visited, uh, if they meet a certain criteria, then the PMP would generate a letter to the, the individual's uh, practitioners just notifying them that it may be of their interest to verify a PMP report on that particular patient. We wouldn't be sending the report, it wouldn't be a requirement that they check, but it would just simply be more information at their hands, at their fingertips, so they can make a proper decision on, on their prescribing. And then we'd also like to expand the reporting from Schedule 2 through 4 to include Schedule 5. And some of the Schedule 5 controlled substances that you'd be familiar with are things like Lyrica, um, codeine containing cough suppressants, Things like promethazine with codeine, um, which which we recently the board of pharmacy had a case in which a technician had diverted uh, about 20, 20 or twenty two bottles of promethazine with codeine, and from a pharmacist's perspective, you, you kind of scratch your head, uh, thinking why would you do that? And apparently, there's there's quite a uh, black market for for that, and uh, DEA had reported those bottles go for about nine hundred dollars on the street. And that, uh, those dispensings are not currently being reported to the PMP. We've had fictitious prescriptions, which patients have just written their own for promethazine with codeine. 
uh, one pint bottles, and again, that information is not currently captured. Lamotil is another issue. Uh, it's used to treat diarrhea, diphenoxylate, and, and atropine. It's very chemically uh, similar to meparidine or Demerol. And at regular doses, it's used to treat diarrhea. It's quite effective, and it works in the intestines. But at, at uh, doses that are above recommended dosages, it loses its specificity and enters the bloodstream and can act just like meparidine. So there's a potential for uh, the abuse of uh, Lamotil as well. And again, that's not currently being reported. The Board of Pharmacy has also implemented a provision in the CARA um, Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act in which controlled substances could be, in Schedule II, can be partially filled um, by the request or on the request of the prescriber uh, or the patient. So, so you think of a prescription for hydrocodone or Vicodin, if it were written for 30, a practitioner could very well write on that prescription, please dispense 10 tablets and the patient may return on X date to get the remainder if necessary. So it could be something that, uh, that permits the provider to offer uh, proper uh, length of time for pain management and, and still all the while keeping the number of dosage units uh, restricted. The patient would have 30 days to then come back to, uh, to get the remainder of that prescription. And those, um, those rules uh, have, already been, uh, have already been noticed and, uh, and are in the, uh, in the works there. In the meanwhile, the board had written a uh, newsletter article to its pharmacies suggesting that anything uh, pertaining to CARA regarding this partially partial fill of uh, C2s, the board would not take any action and, and encourage the pharmacies to uh, go ahead and act on that. The Board of Pharmacy also operates medication disposal program. We have, uh, since 2016, we had a new vendor for our controlled substance take-back receptacles. We've been working closely with ODCP to get those receptacles placed in every one of Iowa's 99 counties. Um, and as of November 1st, we will have officially physically placed a med drop disposal unit, uh, either, either within the pharmacies or law enforcement offices in every one of Iowa's counties. And by July uh, 1st, 2018, we intend to have, just within the Board of Pharmacy, 100 med drop units um, placed. We'll continue to grow that and hopefully uh, get some larger chains on board that we can have a, a larger, larger reach. Education and outreach. We have uh, we hired a, an individual, specific pharmacist, specifically dedicated to uh, the PMP, and she has um, she has been in her position since the beginning of 2017, and she has uh, uh, been all over the state, traveling and educating folks and, and taking um, speaking engagements uh, on behalf of the board and the PMP and. Um, expanding or explaining what it is the PMP does, where we're going, what we see for the PMP in the future. And I think that's, uh, that's been very beneficial to us getting the word out. I think that covers the majority of my notes. I will um, maybe just, just mention some brief uh, statistics from the PMP. This is up to date as of October 1st, 2017. I, it, in 2016, we had 300 million uh, dosage units of controlled substances dispensed. Annualized uh, year to date to October 1st, so annualized through the end of the year, we've had a 10% reduction in those total number of dosages dispensed. That's a positive in, uh, in my opinion. Our C2s uh, have been, the, the number of dosages dispensed per prescription has also decreased. Our C3s and C4s have also decreased um, throughout the year. Thank you. Any questions? <coughs> you said earlier on that you were trying to get some information for us on the way in. What were you asking for from the provider? I'm, I'm sorry, say that again. You said earlier on you were wanting to find out this information for us to weigh in is taking 72 hours to get that information back from the... Oh, yes. We, we, were, we were attempting to get some... I was attempting to get some dispensing data back from our vendor and... What data? What was the information again? Exact dosage, um, number of dosage units for a particular drug. Who's the vendor? 
Akers Health. So, who's that again? Akers Health. Akers? A P P R I S S. This is all computerized, right? That's right. So I just pulled my phone here, and they're going to charge you $69.44 an hour for a 72 hour period to get information back that's already digitized? That sounds about right. Okay. Are they part of this RP process going forward for the new uh, PlayStation 4, as you said? <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, I, I would fully intend to receive a response from them. They operate PMPs in probably 45 of the, of the states across the United States. We, 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 and, and to clarify, the, 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 the contract we're under is, is dated, and Appers Health also has varying levels of, or types of software, and we're, we're utilizing the, the most outdated and antiquated software. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, there's going to be a question implied in this statement, and it's up to you to figure out what it is and respond to it. <laughs> when I ran the Detroit State Healthcare Coalition in Dubuque back in the 80s, the 90s, cost of healthcare increasing exponentially, employers and unions have to put the cost. We tried to talk with the healthcare industry to look at how do we get a hold of these <coughs> issues, and at that point, uh, what we were, what we talked about was derided as cookbook medicine. We now know it as evidence-based medicine. It's been, I think, embraced by the pharmacists, physicians, and others as well. Um, and now we're stuck in this question of whether or not we are going to man make use of evidence-based protocols, mandatory or voluntary, voluntary, and should we require by law, etc. <coughs> As a sports official for the last 20 years, I have had on a yearly basis required to get a minimum of five different licenses to practice officiating. I'm required to go to continue education probably two or three days a year, and I'm told what uh, rules I have to enforce uh, and the tools I need to use to do that, like a whistle. And if I stop using those rules or those tools, I guarantee you the experience is not going to be one that players, coaches, or spectators are going to appreciate. <laughs> so my question is, if the, if the system is there and it works, and the information that providers need is in it, uh, and we understand what we need to do with that information, why is this question of whether or not pharmacists, in your case, should be required to use it? I think if you're if you're talking about the, the requirement of, of utilizing the PMP and whether or not that is the direction to go, um, I, would, I would just be, I would be cautious with, with that. I think if we increase, uh, if we better our technology and we can figure out ways to get this information to their fingertips um, and have that information be accurate, and be timely. Why? Why wouldn't you use it? Why? If it's if it's just simply another tab in your medical health record, why, why wouldn't you click that tab? Or in the dispensing software, if if again it's just another tab, why wouldn't you do that? I think I think it would, in my mind, be a sort of a common sense thing that if we make it easy. If your registration is simple, we tie it to controlled substance registration. Why wouldn't you? I can give you one reason. Sure. Um, in many cases, we have this experience in a project in the view. Pharmacists don't necessarily like the feedback they get from physicians when they make suggestions regarding, you know, issues related to their patients. Uh, sometimes I make decisions that coaches and players I heard, could have helped someone who ended up overdosing. And I wouldn't want to be the healthcare provider um, who ends up hearing that somebody they could have helped overdose because they didn't use this system. And maybe there's even some legal, legal repercussions that may be associated with that. So whether or not it's perfect today or it ever becomes perfect today, people are dying because of this and hopefully that might be the incentive for people, 
pharmacists, in your case, use the system? As I have stated before, the PMP is an invaluable product. We use it a lot in my community pharmacy setting. And no one likes mandates, but like you said, if the software is developed where it's efficient, timely, it doesn't take up a lot of time, and uh, provides that very useful information to the prescriber, uh, why not? Uh, so. I think it's uh, something that we need to do. Obviously, we need to get you a new PlayStation. I'm waiting. Well, the data that you collect um, and have, as we look at bringing all the data together into one spot and be able to talk to each other and understand what's going on, will that your PMP have the capability of transmitting that and, and, and putting it into a a central repository so we can have all of the information there. Uh, information as far as who, who are you talking like for research and statistical purposes or for providers or? Research, Department of Health, knowing the effectiveness of what we're doing, how is our epidemic, I mean if we look at the right. data and the prescribing and, and also the treatment numbers, I mean you have to, you have to have a handle on all this where you can't measure what we're doing and how effective we are. Yeah, the, the dispensing data, the de-identified dispensing data um, is, is available to public health. We, we, we have shared that information with them since we, we've been able to do that. Uh, in, the, in the future, with new software, we will be able to do that more quickly and more readily uh, for them and, and probably drill down just a little bit further into, uh, into what we give them. I just know sometimes hospitals have different systems. Epic versus Cerner. Mm -hmm. They don't talk to each other, but yet there is software out there now that can put those two networks together and they can't talk to each other. Um, yeah, the, the you Iowa Health I mean? Yeah, the Iowa Health Information Exchange Network is I think a, a good example of that. That's another area that we're looking at taking the PMP and integrating as well into that for as an option as opposed to going to each of the individual software vendors. So you mentioned integration and you don't have the money. So what are we looking at here as we move forward? Well we, we have we have the money for the software. We have the money to, to, to do an initial pilot. Um, but you know if you were to look at all of your controlled substance registration uh, folks within the state and pharmacies uh, you, you would be in order to fund that, uh, we could do that with through fees, and I don't know the number off the top of my head, but I had calculated it a couple weeks ago. We would need to change our fee, uh, controlled substance registration. We'd need to change that from every two years to every year and increase it by $30. A year? And a, a year, that's correct. That's not a lot. That's if we were to go that route of, of offering integration and funding that integration through uh, the Board of Pharmacy through the, through the program. Otherwise, it's just a matter of whoever wants to integrate, uh, it's there. There's a connection fee of $7,500, roughly, and then there's a per user uh, fee that they have to pay uh, annually. So, I mean, like, Senator V, like, with your pharmacy, it could be $30 more dollars a year, is that for the take? That, so, right now, our, our our registration we, we do every two years and our, we have a we have a fee for that registration it's ninety dollars and and so I was just doing some calculating on what what our cost would be for integration how where could we find the money and this was this was where I, I was able to find it if we move that fee from every two years to every year and then increase it from ninety to one twenty we have our money. Any other questions? Oh. We also, we do have some grant money that, uh, that the Department of Public Health has helped us uh, procure. And that is roughly around $400,000, which we will use for the, the new software. And the board, the board office has 
uh, has money set aside for that software, but rather than use it for that, we intend to use that to do our, our pilot integration project. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the update. Appreciate it. I guess we're going to break for lunch now. Um, we're 10 minutes behind on what the schedule is, so we're still going to take an hour for lunch. So we'll see everybody an hour from now, which will be five till one. Thank you.